Welcome to episode one of the Downtown Podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk to you about how you can be part of what's happening in downtown Las Vegas. We're going to introduce you to a New York Times bestseller, a man that wrote a book about serendipity and coined a ubiquitous tech term that is an anagram of glob. All that and more in episode one of the Downtown Podcast. All right. Well, thank you, everybody who gave us feedback on our inaugural episode. It was downloaded over 300 times. That makes us the number one place to find bad news, wacky news, and freeze-ups. So we appreciate that. And to make things even better, today we brought a live studio audience. <laughs> I'm telling you, it gets more professional by the day. So, um, you know, there was bigger demand than we expected to be here in the audience. So next week, we're going to be RSVPing on TicketCake.com. If you guys want to be here live, it comes with bean dip and beer, so don't forget it. And Sometimes now I'm going to pass it off to the only girl that's ever been on this show, Melissa Volkman. Hi, guys. Oh, wait, hold on. Technical difficulties. Maybe. Just hit start. <laughs> we're getting there, I swear. <laughs> All right, let's start, start off with some exciting Vegas tech news. ALU's mobile app just launched into private beta with limited crowd testing. ALU. The app focuses on helping people discover local, passion, and community-focused gatherings in Las Vegas. It should be launched citywide in early December, and be sure to submit your email at alu.net to be one of the first people to hear when it's available in the App Store. And uh, speaking of events around town, if you haven't had a chance to check out the speaker series at the Downtown Project Construction Zone yet, <laughs> now is your chance. Next week from Wednesday to Saturday, there will be multiple amazing speakers each day, like Michael Uslan, who produced several of the Batman movies and cartoons, and Cameron Sinclair, one of the co-founders and chief eternal officer of the Architecture for Humanity. For the full list of speakers and times, check out TicketTake.com and be on the lookout for flyers posted around downtown with the listings. <laughs> with the holidays around the corner, it's time to start hunting for the ideal gifts for your loved ones. Here to talk more about the upcoming event to help you with solve that conundrum is Polly Wein Weinstein Sorry, <laughs> with Neon Bazaar. Yay, Polly. <laughs> I came bearing gifts. I came bearing gifts. Oh, you got one of the awesome shirts. Oh, yeah. Here yeah. you go. We got some Neon Bazaar shirts. Woo yeah, shop yeah. local. Shop local. There's that. <gasps> oh, There's me. that. Oh, this and is I brought great. In another little something for you. Uh, oh, surprise. Merry okay. Christmas. She's my new best friend. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, I'm here to talk about Neon Bazaar, which is gonna be a local shopping event happening in Jackie Gone Parkway, right downstairs of the Ogden. Um, the event is happening November 24th from noon to 8 p.m. It's an all local shopping event. Almost knocked off your wine. No. Um, besides all local retailers, there's gonna be entertainment, a wine walk, food trucks, and the whole event is uh, it's presented by VM Vintage and Modern, and we have a lot of local sponsors. Small businesses from all over Las Vegas are helping to contribute to make the event happen, so that's really amazing. Um, we have a Twitter, which is uh, Neon Bazaar, two A's in Bazaar, uh, and we're using the hashtag shop local. Shop tweet local. that, tweet it. <laughs> tweet it, shop local. Um, what else? Our website, where you can see our vendors and more information about the event, is www.neonholidaybazaar.com. Um, and on Saturday night, I'll be at the Streets Food Truck Festival, mm -hmm. set up previewing some of the goodies and showing the vendors that are going to be at the event. And for the first person who comes up and sees me and says, I saw you on the Downtown Podcast, I have a, another present for them. Santa comes early. What is that uh, it's super secret, amazing oh, present. Secret. So that means you have to go. You have to come down and find me at streets and oh, and streets. say you saw me. Say you saw awesome. me on the downtown podcast. Yay. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, Holly. Uh, Thank you. Coming. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. That's awesome. Thank you. All right. So for everybody that thought we were just a bunch of clowns putting a little podcast together, guess what? 
We have a New York Times best-selling author. We have Lane Becker, who wrote this book, Get Lucky. It's how to put planned serendipity to work for you and your business. Let's welcome him on the stage. Or the, the table of truth. Yeah. Thanks, appreciate you coming out. Hi, everybody. Hey. I like these microphones. Aren't they cute? That's already been the logo. Our deco, yeah. little buttons. They don't really work, but you know. Yeah, no, we try. Get stuff at the They're just a little expensive. Won't tell anybody. Expensive and don't work. Yeah. Good work. I know. All right. We're working on it. So, uh, so the main thing I got from it is basically what you're trying to tell people is if they're having trouble with their love life, what they need to do is a lot of speed dating. That's is right. That's right. Basically, thing about? that's basically what I was getting at. Yeah. Okay. It's, the book is about how to score. Uh, Good. All right. Well, uh, that's what I was hoping to hear, because uh, that's the only kind of books I read. I need it real bad. I can, yeah, so, I can see <laughs> No. Okay. It's going to be okay. So listen, I, uh, I listened to you and your co-author, Thor, from the Marvel Comics, superhero, almost <gasps> immortal. Thor, right? What? It's true. That's true. I'm just going to tell you now, in case you look at the author photo, my co-author is the least Thor-looking human being you'll ever meet. No, they just no offense, co-author Thor. <laughs> Superheroes call that a disguise. It's not, yeah, that's right, that's, that's right. 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 So, he's, definitely, um, he's definitely more the Clark Kent side of things. Um, but while listening to your uh, TEDx Oxbridge, um, I noticed uh, something that you said about serendipity is what happens when chance meets creativity. Right. So we sort of talk about serendipity as an equation. We were, we were trying to take the book. We were trying to talk, talk about luck and serendipity in a way that was um, uh, sort of digestible, something that, you know, we wanted to write a business book about it, take it out of the land of sort of like woo-woo crazy and actually just make it a sort of a simple concept. And so we developed an equation. And the equation really is just serendipity equals chance plus creativity. So if you want to understand how to sort of have more luck in your life, how to have more serendipity, it's pretty straightforward when you look at it from this equation perspective. You need to increase the chance in your life or you need to increase the creativity. And that's creativity in its strict definition, which is um, creativity is your ability to sort of put something new, original, and different into the world. That's all creativity is. So your ability to increase either of those is the thing that makes it more likely that good things, um, things that you want, things that you need, things that are going to advance you will happen. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, it stood out to me as something that uh, I hadn't really ever thought of it as a, an equation before, I guess. I guess, I mean, that's probably the big point of this book is uh, to let people know that it's not just magic. It actually is something a business can implement, something that can help you. Yeah. Help the, your bottom line, right? Yeah, the goal of the book really was to be, like, extraordinarily practical about this stuff, to take it to take it down from a level of uh, sort of something that people feel like is a black box or something I can't control or can't predict uh, and, and give examples, give very clear direction, essentially, uh, we talk about the eight skills of planned serendipity in the book, and each of those is just uh, both at an individual and an organizational level in the sense that like, organizations can be structured in ways that encourage certain kinds of behaviors, and uh, if you recognize serendipity as just a set of behaviors that individuals can you know, enact, right. then you can build businesses that encourage those kinds of behaviors. And so the book just tries to look at what those eight skills are and then show people, like, here's what you can do. Here are simple, very, uh, like, very practical, very programmatic steps that individuals and organizations can put together that are going to make them ultimately luckier. It's interesting. All right, if you could, uh, if you were going to this quote by Thomas Jefferson. Um, Never heard of him. So, so me and a friend of me were having an argument, and uh, we have a, we were talking about this quote by Thomas Jefferson. It says, he says, I'm a great believer in luck, and I find the harder I work, the more of it I have. Is this a nod towards serendipity, or if it's not, what would need to change about this quote? Yeah, no, that's it. I mean, you know, when people ask me for the like the TLDR version of <laughs> our book, um, those are the people who don't even don't even you have time it? don't even have time for TEDx. Uh, I just tell them like the one sentence version of our book is good luck is hard work. Like that's what it comes down to. I mean that's what everything in this life ultimately comes down to. You know every single person that we talked to, interviewed, you know, uh, profiled in the book. Uh, you know, I could describe pretty much every one of them as, you know, a 10-year overnight success, right? Like you work your ass off for a really, really long time, and then suddenly it looks like, hey, you were really successful, right? right? And people look at that, and they like, all they see is the last part where you were, hey, you were really successful, and they miss the 10 years that you spent working on that idea, pushing that thing forward, fighting with everybody, sort of trying to put this thing into the universe. Right. That, so, so yeah. that's, that's a pattern you've realized with a lot of successful people is that it seemed like they were overnight successes after tons and tons of work that we didn't see before that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the thing I love, so I, I, my background is in technology and I've done a, bun done a bunch of startups and some have worked and some haven't and spent a lot of time with startup people. And one of the things that I love about the world of technology and the world of startups is that when you're successful with a startup, especially on the consumer side, but even on the business side, uh, like the growth and the scale of your business is so... 
like absurd, right? You're like Instagram, right? You go from like zero to you know a gazillion users in no time at all, and then you sell for what was a billion dollars, and then become yeah. seven hundred and thirty million, because Wall Street doesn't like you, and like whatever. But um, the thing that fascinates me about it is like there's, it, it sort of it, it forces you to acknowledge the role of luck. Right, because there's no human being on this planet that can say like I got from one to a you know one to a billion dollars in two years all by myself. Like nobody's crazy enough to say that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and there's this great quote from Kevin Systrom, where he was basically like, as much as entrepreneur right after the sale, he was like, as much as entrepreneurs want to pretend that everything that they do is like some brilliant, grand idea, the truth is that luck is a huge part of it. And I think that the thing that's great about working on the internet is you're forced to admit that, right? right? Like, you're operating at such speed and such scale that you can't take all the responsibility. And so you have to acknowledge that part of what works for you is that you're willing to build these environments or these structures around you that are open to serendipity or open to the unexpected and that you're willing to react to it. Like, that's where the success, the success comes from. So, some right. of, we actually worked really hard not to have any like Zappos um, anecdotes. There, yeah. is, there is a Zappos anecdote in this book. It comes about like two thirds of the way through, but it's not a common one. It's a really weird and unusual one that nobody else had used. Right, we were right, trying so very, very hard to like play against type on that one because just oh, a little, that's it's a little fair. too easy. That's totally fair. Um, uh, but you know, I had this. Uh, I had had two great experiences now actually in the Ogden, this building that we're in. Uh, since I got here, I've run into two people already that I knew but wasn't expecting to see, right? Sorry. And yeah, no, and, I, and everybody I talk to has pretty much the same Stay experience here, you. right? Like the first, uh, the first chapter in this book of the eight skills, the first one is called motion, mm -hmm. right? And motion is about collision, right? And collision is something that people are really familiar with here. It's just the idea that if you move more, this is, I forget his name right now because I've been drinking, but there's a <laughs> famous American inventor. I remember that he invented air conditioning. Um, oh. I should remember his name. And uh, he has this great quote. No, he he says, he's... <laughs> He says that uh, um, uh, nobody ever stumbled over anything sitting down, right? And like his whole it. point is that like the, the nature of invention is to just get up, to get out of your routine, to put yourself in um, familiar contact, uh, like unfamiliar environments, but familiar contexts, right? And that's pretty much what happens here on a regular occurring basis every day. So it's yeah. not that you know, is, this, is, this is a fantastic example of planned serendipity, right? Like you just, you create an environment in which you know that something will happen, right. but you don't, right. You don't try and control what is going to happen. You simply say, if we put enough people in the same place and we know that they have enough of similar related interests, then it's a fairly safe bet that you know maybe 999 <laughs> out of every yeah. thousand interactions aren't going to matter, but the thousandth interaction is going to create something lot, right? yeah, fantastic yeah. or unusual. So was Delivering Happiness published at a time when you started writing this book? Uh, was Delivering Happiness was actually published before this. I, it wasn't so much the, the Delivering Happiness book per se that influenced it. It just, it was, but certainly like sort of spending time with Zappa, spending time with Tony, sort of understanding the way that they thought definitely influenced some of our thinking about how this book works. But to me, it's actually bigger than just Zappos. To me, you look at a company like Zappos, you look at something like the Downtown Project and what it's trying to do in terms of like city scale and city infrastructure. And you see that that's actually really, I think that's much bigger. To me, it's much more about like the way that the world is heading generally. Right. right? There's this, not to get all intellectual for a second, oh, no. but no. there is this, there is this drink, everybody. Every time I say Hegelian, everybody drink. Oh. So there's this, thank you. Shout out to the philosophy major. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so there, but different Hegel. So there's this guy named John Hegel, super okay. interesting guy, um, wrote a book called The Power of Pull, and it's, uh, he's got this sort of, he talks about um, how we're moving, when it comes to sort of creating value and understanding where like you can really make an impact on the way that the world works or moves or the changes. Um, he talks about how we're going from a world of stocks to a world of flows, right? So he says that value used to be, and if you look at the traditional media industry, this is an example of it, value used to come from stocks. And stocks are the idea that like what you do is you hoard knowledge, right? So you understand how to organize people to create news and how to print newspapers. And so you put all of that in one building and then you basically like you put up big walls between that and the rest of the world and then you charge for access to it, right? So that's a stock. You have a stock of information and you charge the world for access. But that's not where value is created now, right? Like the right. world has changed in a really fundamental way. Value is now created through flows. Flows are what happen when you are a conduit for knowledge. You are a conduit for information. You allow the flow of information to move 
uh, through you, right? So that actually requires a different way of thinking about how you structure your business, a different way of thinking about how your business relates to other businesses, a different way of thinking about how your business relates to the world more broadly. So when I look at something like Zappos or when I look at something like the downtown project and something as simple as uh, the way that they sort of like looked at the sort of campus concept and said, what if we made the campus the whole city, mm -hmm. right? The entire downtown area instead of like hoarding all of that uh, uh, and sort of, like yeah, yeah and, and sort of only making it available to the people who work there. What if we made it available to everyone? To me, that's about taking this concept of like stocks and the way that stock and value was created and sort of moving it more right. towards Never flow. Thought. But yeah. I think that that's like Hegel's point is that that is the way that the world is going. Like that is where all value is now, yes. right? And it's just a question of like how fast everybody's going to figure it out, right? So I look at something like this and I think this is a leading indicator, right? Um, these guys at the Institute of the Future who call it a weak signal, right? Like it's, a, it's a, a weak signal in the sense that like it's the very first thing. It's just a little thing off in the distance, but you look at it and you point at it and you say like that is the way that the whole world's gonna go. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, uh, what you're talking about is really fascinating. And um, you know, one of the things that uh, stuck out to me when we talked for a second yesterday was some of the information that you had about how CERN uh, was actually managing these uh, distributed systems, even though these are scientists that are all in remote locations. So I was wondering if you could maybe touch a little bit more on how they built the LHC and how they yep. created serendipity there. Yeah, so C CERN, which um, for those of you in the audience who don't spend a lot of time studying European science organizations, <laughs> Um, CERN, is, CERN yeah. is this really interesting sort of pan-European uh, union organization that is basically uh, sort of unites like a lot of sort of science, uh, like sort of scientists and scientific organizations across Europe. And um, the Large Hadron Collider, which everybody was briefly worried was going to crush the entire <laughs> universe, but turned out not to do and instead <laughs> seems to be working out pretty well, um, was a project of CERN. Anyway, uh, CERN does this really interesting thing, right? Because they're across like a bazillion, well, not a bazillion, but they're across like all these European countries and uh, they touch on all these different science, scientists and different sort of scientific organizations. And so uh, we talk about them in a, we talk about the skill of connection in our book, Amazon.com. So um, we talk about the skill of connection and connection is not like how many people you're connected to, but it's about the quality of the connections that you have and the, the understanding you have, the value that you have in sort of transferring knowledge across different nodes in a network. Uh, and so what CERN does that I love is CERN basically says like, you know what? There's no reason that serendipity has to be just confined to you know, a building, right? Like we can institutionalize serendipity. They have a knowledge transfer unit and it is designed to do just to transfer knowledge. Right, so they have a whole group at CERN and their whole job is to build tools and to build infrastructure and to create both at the technological level and at the cultural level and at sort of being the event and organizational level that's designed to do nothing but like say, hey, we found a cool idea over here in Brussels. Does anybody else think that it would be interesting or valuable? Is there any other way that we can apply this? And what I love about CERN is they basically, like they don't treat serendipity like something that's just gonna maybe happen. Right, they have built right. infrastructure that supports it. They understand that these scientists are coming up with breakthrough ideas every day, but unless they have the infrastructure, unless they have the ability to sort of spray that knowledge as far and as wide as possible, it's never ever gonna get picked up. But and so all this group does is build that. Yeah, and what kind of tools did they come up with? Because I mean, I'm guessing this isn't an email blast. They like, do, what no, they, no, like, what, what they he, no, it's hilarious. With? They do, they, <laughs> yeah, it's, what I, yeah. it's, what I love about serendipity is it's super messy, right? Like, that's what's great about it. Like, yeah, you know, it's totally entropic. Like, you just can't predict the value of it. It's just, you never know when it's going to. And so they do everything. Like, they have, they at no point if they can find it to just one thing. They totally have email lists. Okay. <laughs> they have email lists. They do email blasts. Yeah, they literally the have these scientists who are like, <laughs> hey, anyway. you know, yeah. it's still, they have like, hey, I invented this CAT scanner thing, and maybe it's, you know. Um, but they do other stuff, too. They actually do events. They do, like, get-togethers. They understand that, you know, that so much of the world, even especially perhaps with scientists, happens when they're drinking beers together. <laughs> so they do Get stuff like that. Right. They also have very specific tools that they have created, like web applications that are designed to sort of seek out and share knowledge. Um, the, the thing that they do is it's just, it's very, um, it's very, I don't know what to call it, like, it's very like, tactical, you know what I mean? Like, they're just like, what can we do? Like, what are, not just like, what is the channel, but what are all the channels yeah. that we could potentially use? Because once you understand that it's unpredictable, once you understand that you don't know. You gotta embrace that messiness yeah. and just go you, down every Yeah, just every everything you can do, might pay off. which I think is kind of amazing. Yeah. It is amazing. No, that really is. Um, okay, so according to your LinkedIn account, uh, you have interest <laughs> in both modern <laughs> neuroscience and pool parties. So you're kind of all over the place there. But so it sounds like, uh, ideally, yeah. all three at the same time. 
Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. the neuroscience test at the pool. That's, I can see where that go. But So does serendipity have to happen in a living organism, or can serendip serendipity be accelerated between non-organic systems, such as the neurons in a brain? I have no idea. Okay. So <laughs> whatsoever, but, but, but I'm glad but, you but asked. My question is, is so yeah. serendipity have to be um, actually like a living organism? Does it have to be people saying, like, I actively want to share this? Or is this something where you can say, like, look, I want to train my brain to have the skills oh, to actually no, I get have you. more I get serendipity? You going. Um, I think it's very much the latter. I think these are just ways of thinking about uh, how we operate. A lot of them are actually counterintuitive, you know? Like, um, a lot of, so a super simple example, right, is like um, one of the things I think, you know, I come from Silicon Valley, and one of the things that makes Silicon Valley really successful is that it has a culture of real transparency, right? Like, people are very open. Here's my idea. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm up to. Right, and once you say that, it allows you to connect with things, places, people, environments, ideas, experiences, trust, yeah. right, that you might not have otherwise. But that is, yeah, it is, it is a trust-based approach, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's, some of it is trust, some of it is just recognizing that ideas are relatively meaningless compared mm -hmm. to execution. I think yeah. exper it's experience <laughs> yeah, as much as trust, I guess I would say. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. And I think, um, but, but what I experience when I like talk to you know, like, um, communities in other environments is that that's not the case at all, like they're still very closed. I think the, the urge to protect an idea is an intuitive one, yeah, right? I think it's sort of a very human and intuitive thing and learning to not think that way, uh, training yourself not to think that way, training yourself to think counterintuitively right. is incredibly valuable. It helps to be in an environment or a culture that encourages it. But if you can do that, then I think you're in pretty good shape. So I think in that sense, it's extraordinarily learnable. But I do think that most of what makes I think the reason that there are so few truly successful people, at least at the scale that we're talking about, or at least the truly successful, is because to, the ability to do that is essentially the ability to embrace a lot of sort of counterintuitive right. impulses. And I do think that you have to figure out how to train yourself. Some people are able to do that kind of on their own, mostly because they're jerks, um, <laughs> or like wildly unable to connect with others. But, but I think that for most people, the value comes and the ability to do that comes from being situated in an environment like Silicon Valley or like the downtown project here, where everyone thinks that way. And once everyone thinks that way, learning to think that way becomes something that you can do as well. Yeah. All right. Well, um, you know, we try to cover all the stuff that's happening downtown, but I happen to come from the Vegas tech side of things. So uh, I was pretty interested to find out what you might have learned um, at some of the experiences you've had, like growing companies, leaving them when they were going good and selling. Like, what are some of the uh, messages you could teach other people that uh, have startups around here that are really trying to it's succeed? Like half our audience. Half the <laughs> audience? Um, uh, so I used to have this joke. I used to say, this is like post post whatever rationalization. They used to say that I would, like, I would always leave companies at the stage at which, like, they could finally afford nice furniture. <laughs> like, it was my way. They just like, no. I used to, but it was go. like, it was rational. I, mean, I don't believe this anymore. Like, it was rationalization. I would try to make myself feel better about the fact that, like, I thought I was a starter, not a finisher, whatever. It's kind of bullshit. Can I say bullshit? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Good. We had a swear jar. Here we are. Yeah, we, do, we, well, we don't have a swear jar no, yet. No, we don't have awesome. a swear jar yet. I, I'll, I'll throw. Yeah. I'll throw it twenty minutes. He's paying for the beer later. Yeah. Fantastic! You can keep buying my drinks all night. Um, <laughs> what was that? Well, we, cause we, we're talking about some of your other. Oh yeah, thanks. Can, so yeah. I used to like say this all the time, but the truth is, like, I uh, that's not a good attitude to have. Like, if you start something, you should finish it. Absolutely. And I look at the companies that I've started, and I think, you know, I. Uh, at every point that I've left something that I've started for whatever reason, because it was changing, because it was sort of morphing into something that maybe wasn't the thing that I expected or what I planned at the beginning, I feel like there's real value in saying, like, what is it going to take for me to stick with this thing all the way through to the end? Like, what is it going to take for me to sort of, like, hang on? So I'll give you an example. Like, I worked at, so my last company is called Get Satisfaction. It was a customer service company. We started with this idea that we were going to be a very consumer-facing service, right? So everybody think back wobbly lines to 2007, um, the Time far works. distant past before Facebook, before Twitter. And, uh, and we had this idea with Get Satisfaction, which is that 2007, this was crazy, that, um, or at least the investors or potential investors all told us that this was crazy. We had this idea that like, you know, companies would be getting closer to their customers, that there would be this new channel for communication through social media, and that, peop and that companies would use an online channel to actually communicate with their customers directly, right? So a two-way market two conver two conversation, not a one-way bullhorn, right? Yeah, so absolutely. 
madness in 2007, and Get Satisfaction was really founded on that idea. So we built this site, and we called it Customer Service Without Companies. It was just for you know, customers to talk to each other, solve problems, ask questions, whatever, and companies could participate. And then what happened was it turned out that not only did companies participate, but companies like really participated. Right. Like not only did they, then we'd come to us and they'd show like a year into this company and we have all these, com we had this hilarious meeting a year into this company where like literally the entire top executive team of Procter & Gamble, right? So like Cincinnati, Ohio, right, 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 like 100 right. years old. I, get this, I remember this phone call. They call us up and they're like, we think what you're doing is amazing. We want to bring our executive team to your office. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Right, like all the so they show team. up in our office. Our office is a shithole. And <laughs> it's all these like old white guys and one old white woman. And like they all show up and they all, she was marketing. And they all like sit down. Of course, of course. Of course. And they all, they all sit down and we're like, oh God, what are we? What yeah, are what we, are we in for? What is right. happening? And like we have this amazing conversation with them about like what we're doing in the future. And um, in the future, and they're totally into it, right? Because they kind of, they can see the writing on the wall. And, um, and then at the end of it, they say like, great, what can we buy? We're like. Oh, I think something up have, real quick. <laughs> yeah, like, we, uh, have, we have nothing to sell you. Um, we thought it was a consumer service. And so like it took us two years to figure out how to like turn it into a business where we could sell to them. Right, and then yeah. it got to that place. This is my long ass version of this story to get to the answer to your question. Um, we got to this place where like, we were selling to them, right? Like we had a pipeline, we were using Salesforce, we were you know, making millions and millions of dollars selling to all these different businesses, large retail brands. And at the time I remember thinking like, this is cool and it's working and we saved the company, but it's not what I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I was yeah. still really stuck on that at the time. Like I thought it was gonna be this consumer service. Like yeah. I had this vision. And that what vision happens? didn't play out, yeah. right? Like reality slammed into my vision, and even though we figured out how to make it work, I still, I still couldn't like wrap my head around that. You know, mm -hmm. I still couldn't say like this is what it is, and we need to move forward with it. And I, that is one of my hugest. And so I ended up leaving the company. Mm -hmm. It's a little burnt out. It was oh. rough turning a company around yeah, through the bad. recession of 2008 and 9. But right. we did it, and and like. I mean, whatever, I needed a break, but I, I look back on that time now and I think like I really regret that I wasn't willing, I guess this is my, my point, I, I really regret that I wasn't willing to look at the success that we had, making things sort of be as they were, sort of making oh, it I fit see. into the world. Yeah, your frame you on know? it, yeah. Like, I w I'm sad that like I wasn't able to like shed my model of what I wanted and see what was right in front of me and really like acknowledge and appreciate that and really run with it. Um, and I feel like that's, I feel like that's a challenge for every entrepreneur is like there is a need or desire that you have to like make something happen in the world. That's why you're doing it. Yeah. So, so, right. so did, did adaptive path stay more like how you envisioned it from the beginning at the end? Um, is that, was that what the yeah, difference no, it, between get satisfaction and adaptive path? Or yeah, adaptive path did fine. Did fine. Like adaptive path was this sort of amazing company that managed to like, you know, I mean, we were really like one of the, com I wouldn't call us solely responsible for inventing the field of user experience, but we were certainly one of the companies that was one of the companies that was pushing that concept forward in the early days, and you know that's still just as true as it was. Yeah. I mean, to me, the challenge with adaptive path is like uh, it's sort of a be careful what you wish for. We were like, hey, wouldn't it be amazing if like the entire world thought user experience was important? Right. <laughs> right. Now everybody in the world thinks user experience is important. We're like, oh man, we got a lot of competition now. Yeah. So, but you know, that's not a bad problem to have. No, it's not at all. And well, you know, we're really thankful that you took some time out to come talk to us. This was uh, an awesome opportunity for our very first episode. So um, we're going to let Melissa talk about uh, some of the upcoming events that you guys can come to this week to participate more in what's happening in downtown Las Vegas. And thank you. I appreciate thank it. You. Yeah. Thanks, man. Appreciate it very Thanks, much. So, yeah. Woo! Woo! yeah. Woo! yeah. Woo! That's good. Off to a good start. That was awesome. Okay. All right. So to wrap our upcoming events, like, so for Friday the 9th, there is the second annual Hero School Suit and Tech Drive from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Craig P. Kenny Penthouse, which is right down the road. Entry is free with any donation of employment clothing, tech, or cash. You know, you can help the unemployed Nevadans get back into the game and have fun while doing so. So the heroschool.us for the more details. Sorry. You go, Todd. Um, this Saturday also has a few awesome events. First up is the Downtown Cares Neighborhood Cleanup, starting in the 18B Art District at 9 a.m. Help beautify your neighborhood with our friends from Zappos. Ooh. If that's not enough incentive, Ooh. there will be barbecue, I swear, for any volunteers that goes. 
And after that, our illustrious Lane Becker will be speaking at the Downtown Construction Zone at noon. The mixer starts at 11 a.m., so if you'd like to chat with him, um, that would be a great time to do so. And to round off your Saturday evening Globe Salon, which I love. Thank you, Amanda Wolf, for my awesome haircut. Um, this is their, they're hosting their annual Fashion of Fling at the Tim Babington Studio. Prepare yourselves for an awesome artistic evening of tasty eats and drinks, fashion and fun, and it's all to L uh, uh, benefit the LV Art Reach Program at Casa de Luz. You can read more about that at fashion, thefashionfling.com. And on Monday, as always, our Downtown Makes You Smarter classes, uh, that also which are at the Downtown Construction Zone, um, our own Fode, Fode, who's behind the camera, will be teaching a class on Final Cut Pro at 7 p.m., so be sure to sign up on Skillshare and come through. For more details about all of these events and listings of our regular weekly events, check out our show notes for guests and speakers and the ALU Digest for events around the valley. Thanks, you guys. So that's yeah. what's coming up next week. I know I'm going to be at that Final Cut uh, I know, me Skillshare. Too. Thanks, Fode. <laughs> Sorry about that first edit on episode zero for you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, but thank you. Uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in for episode one. Uh, episode zero is downloaded a lot, so we appreciate the feedback, and every week it's going to get better and better. So the downtownpodcast.tv, if you want to grab your drink, and everybody in the audience, if you guys have your drink, go ahead and put it up. We appreciate another episode. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All of y'all just running lips, sleeping on a come up flip. Vegas, yeah, we in this bitch. Tweet to your followers, remember like a flashback. Vegas tech, don't forget to spell it with the hashtag. Cali got a tech scene, so does Austin, Texas. All my downtown people screaming, Vegas, we got next, bitch. We got next. We got next. Tell them other cities, we the best one. Getting money out the ass. Yeah. Vegas tech fun, oh. yeah. Got a shot for the summer. Yeah. Buy some new shit, sell my old shit on rum check. Vegas tech. About. Now what will Tony Shay do? Go and grab some drinks with my boys from a Lou Over at the beat, beat. sipping on a PBR Catch us down the street, street. chilling out at DCR Tell me is she drunk yet? Yeah. Keep on drinking till we are Hit up Grant and Goldie, tell them meet us at the Lady Sylvia <laughs> Then sober up and pop up, pizza at the pasta Can't nobody stop us, we seem some like a monster Homie, I'm a monster, somebody should've told you But everybody know I'm down with that Vegas, yeah. Now we in the spot.